This, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Jay Allen Show. Thank you for coming out one more time to hang out to see exactly what we have going on here today. Anyways, thank you for all of the responses from the episode of last week with Emily Kunis. Glad to hear that a lot of you seem to enjoy it. Anyways, before we get too deep into this episode today, I want to talk about some things that we have going on right away. If you have not entered into our latest contest, let me tell you about it real quick. It's the contest where we're giving away a ticket to go to the Accident Investigation Theory in Practice, hosted by Nibin Anand and Todd Conklin. If you want to enter into our giveaway, all you have to do is go to safetyfm.com forward slash contest. That's safetyfm.com forward slash contest. We're giving away a ticket that will get you to go to both sessions, the one hosted by Todd Conklin and Nippin himself. So if you want to enter, like I said, go to safetyfm.com forward slash contest. Anyways, let's talk about some of the things that we have going on today. I have been recently hanging out on social media, and I was able to find this very interesting podcast titled Ted Speaks Live. So, of course, with that being the case, I decided to reach out to Ted himself and say, hey, let's sit down, have a conversation, and let's talk about what you have going on with inside of the industry of safety. So that's where the conversation starts today with me and Ted having a conversation about how he got into safety and everything else that we can talk about. Enjoy it here now on The Jay Allen Show. The Jay Allen Show is streaming now on safetyfm.live. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, I have to tell you, I was looking around on LinkedIn and you popped up and I was like, I'm always interested in what other people are doing. And of course, when I bring somebody onto the show, it normally starts off with the simplest question becomes the most difficult question sometimes. And is why did you decide to get into the world of safety? Yeah, you know, safety has been something that I went to college. A lot of people don't realize that because uh, if you talk to me, people don't think I do go to college. But I went to college and I actually graduated in law enforcement. That's not endorsing. Yeah. That's not endorsing uh, the University of Wisconsin by you saying that. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very true, very true. Um, and, and I was fortunate enough to get a job in law enforcement, and I was a police officer for a couple of years, and um, I really enjoyed always being able to help people. But in law enforcement, it was just a. I wanted to be the Barney Fife in the area. How's that? You know, and, some hold on. Based on age demo, some people might not know exactly what that means. So you have to keep that in consideration too. You know that's very true. Barney Fife uh, was many years ago was a law enforcement officer that tried to uh, uh, be everybody's friend, but also enforce the rules. And so um, that's kind of what, what we try. I tried to do, and I really enjoyed that. But I uh, was fortunate enough to get a job uh, at a hospital and become a safety. And a, um, a security officer. And I really was always I was involved with the security part. But then I started learning the hospital side of things and the safety and what it really can do and make an impact on people's lives. And then from there, I got a job as a safety consultant where I became um, working with a lot of different companies and learning how the general industry worked. And I, I was just fascinated by how they have policies, procedures, respirators, all that type of stuff. And I saw, I really got started to enjoy that more and more. And fortunately, I got a, um, an offer from a construction company that was one of my clients and said, hey, why don't you come on board here and uh, work in safety and travel all over the country and, and help people. And so I did that for a while, and I was fortunate enough to build my way up through that company and uh, become the safety director. Well, hang on. Before we get all the way down there, we'll take it step by step. So don't don't go too far because this is where I'm kind of curious. So what yep. caused you to want? So you went to school for criminal justice. You decide that as you're going through it, you just that you become a police officer. There's some things that you liked. But why did you decide to leave the force? What is it that th- thrilled you so much about safety that was like, hey, I've already I've already actually put in four years going to school for it that you said, hey. Let's go ahead and do the change. I mean, because that's a big step. It is, you know, and I think uh, both of them are very sim- familiar because they're helping people, right? Mm-hmm. And both of them are, are, are to make people safer and that. With law enforcement, you're dealing with a certain population all the time. 
you know, when you're a law enforcement officer. And that gets to be tough. And that really changes, you know, you're working three different shifts. I could be working a night shift and you got to go to court and all that kind of stuff. So as a family, developing a family, bringing a family uh, up, it was tough, you know. So my wife and I just made the decision that we just didn't want to do the three shifts, change mm-hmm. it around, go to court and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that, that we're all involved with it being a police officer. Um, I, I highly respect the police officers. They do a great job. But it just wasn't something that I felt comfortable doing my whole career in. So so, so how does that transition work for you? Because I would under, I would probably imagine, this is just me imagining, of course, there has to be some difficulty from going from an armed officer day in and day out to going into a security guard aspect, even though you're st- you're still doing, you know, you're helping people to an extent. But there's a huge difference between the two. So how do, how was the adapting of that as you as you started to move forward? Well, I think, you know, very similar to what we do in safety, right, Jay, um, is that it's all about people. So you have to be able to work with people. If you can't work with people, you're not going to be successful. I don't care what you do. And so it was just being able to adjust and work with people and, and, and treat them fair and honestly, you know. And I think once you do that, and you do that consistently in the security, people – you get that where uh, people understand what you're trying to do. So what did the people from the force tell you at the time? I mean, I, I, what did your fellow officers tell you when you say, hey, I'm going to leave and I'm going into the security job? Did they think that you had lost it for a few minutes? Yeah, they did. <laughs> they definitely did, you know. Um, but the, I had a lot of, I still have a lot of good friends that are, are police officers working and stuff like that. And it, years now, down the road, they all wish they would have done it. <laughs> so, you know. That kind of thing. So do you ever do you ever miss the force? And I know that, you know, your family played a concept into it. And, and I don't ever want to go back and go, I should have, could have, would have. But do you ever miss being in the force? Um, yeah. In some some days I do. You know, there are those days that, that are. But I'm very happy with the choice that um, my wife and I made, you know, uh, going into the safety route. Because I found that safety has been such an enjoyable passion of mine that I really don't look back at it. So when you talk about changing careers, what are we talking about years wise? Like what year are we talking, give or take, that you decide to make the transition from leaving law enforcement to going into full time safety? Yeah, it was probably in the late nineties. Late nineties. So so we're talking late nineties. So you're having over a twenty year plus career. So as you go into this construction company, well, let's get to the construction company. I know you said you worked as a security guard and saw the side of the health industry, but you as you get to the construction company, how do you get into that? Because I mean that's one heck of a change. Going from going from law enforcement to then security to now construction. I mean, we're talking about a world of difference here. Yeah, you, you know, you're right, Jay. It was a big difference. Um, it was the eye opener for me. I'll be very honest with you. But I think the way that worked for me is, um, as I was saying, the, the, being as I was a safety coordinator before that for a local company, and one of my clients was this construction company, and so they said, "Hey, why don't you come to work for me?" And, and they threw, you know. What we all like is the money, right? Oh, wow, this is a great opportunity. <laughs> and not really thinking about it too much. And so I, I jumped into it and uh, I learned a lot on the job very quickly uh, of how to work with people. Um, of uh, And this is when safety still wasn't where it is today. It was kind of just the, the start of it. And um, people were not very uh, understanding of being able to switch the way they were doing things. Right away. Well, so right then, are, is it still the the blame and shame game? I mean, let's say let's be realistic to this extent. Um, it still occurs today, but is that the case at the time? Is that what you're still seeing? I mean, a little bit heavier involved the workers to blame in that particular regard as you're starting off your career. Yeah, you know, um, I think when we start off, we're always looking at, uh, you know, what happened. You know, mm-hmm. why did this happen? And we were really weren't looking at, oh, maybe. It was us not doing something properly right. Maybe we weren't setting them up to be successful. And so that was something I learned early in my career, you know, um, that, that we had to get better at that. So at what point during your career do people start turning around and go, the positive safety coach? Because it's a very interesting moniker and normally not something that's really normally associated to safety. There's either a safety coach. There is like uh, any other kind of coach with safety, but normally not positive is not the word that ties in. So how do you end up getting with this? That's a great question, Jay. Uh, what I, I've always been a very positive, optimistic individual. I, I love working with people. I, I'm very enthusiastic. I'm a morning person, right? But I learned on that very first job that we were kind of talking about. Um, this is a dirty old foundry. It was 
nothing really good about it every day. Every day you go home, you got stuff in your eyes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you're working with guys that are, are a little unhappy. But if you show them a little bit of kindness and you be able to work with them, um, they can really take that safety to another level and not even know it sometimes. And that's really what I enjoyed doing with them was being able to keep things optimistic, fun, you know, and looking at it, hey, you know what, you know, or, or just making little jokes here and there and keeping people, putting a smile on their face. And then now they're thinking about, oh, well, maybe Ted's not as bad as he appears to be. Or, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the safety stuff isn't all that bad, you know, because pointing at people and telling them what they're doing wrong is not what they want to hear. So they want to hear some, some, some yeah. positiveness. And so I learned that very early in my career that that positive works. And matter of fact, the vice president uh, was interviewing me before I took that job. And he's like, you know, Ted, I don't know if you're going to work. You're, you're, you're much too positive. <laughs> so, so then let me ask the strange question. As you go into it and people are saying how positive you are, well, it's some, it's some versions of safety. Some people refer to the safety department as the safety cop. I'm sure that you didn't look at that as a negative light at the time because you liked law enforcement. You're doing something that you're enjoying because you're interacting with people. So, and people are seeing you in a positive, in a positive sector, which is kind of odd for safety back in the day, not so much now. Right. How are you looking at this at the time? I mean, how, how are you adapting? Are they looking at you more as an operational guy? And then to add on top of that, being as you had not been in the construction field, how does that go? Because you know how it is from time to time. People that, are, people that are out in the field go, I know more than what this guy is telling me. So why is Ted telling me what to do when I have X amount of years of experience? Well, I mean, that, that's another good question. You know, when, when I went out uh, to the projects and stuff, you're right. People look at you, hey, you've never done construction. What do you know about this stuff? And they're right. And I tell them that. I said, well, then how would you do this? You ask them the question back. And then what you find out is that they're going to tell you, they're going to brag about it for a while and then say, okay, well, and so what I always did was versus playing the safety cop, I'd play the dumb cop. <laughs> oh, but I don't understand how this works. I let them tell me how to do the solution, and then they got it. Now what happens is they're telling everybody else. I showed Ted exactly what needed to be done, and he agreed with me. Oh, now, nice. I have, now, now I have a salesperson that's selling our, our product, which is safety. Right. So essentially you have, a you have we'll say, a cheerleader, an influencer, an advocate that's out there because, hey, he agreed with what I had to say. Exactly, yep. Yep, we have a cheerleader going out there and saying, hey, you know what I told Ted or I told that person, you know, now we're going to, this is the way we're going to do it because I came up with it. And that's exactly what you want. So when you kind of look at the, at, we'll call the different religions of safety, that's my wording, not anybody else's, so I don't want to misconstrue anything. Do you lean heavier towards one side of the house than the other? Do you lean towards the leans or the VBS or the hops of the world? Or what exactly do you kind of center a lot of your safety solutions around? Well, you know, I, I've uh, done a lot of education on a lot of a lot of those different ones. So I take little bits of, bits and pieces that that fit me naturally, I guess. Um, oh, so you're non-denomination? I, okay, I got you. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I I really do believe in that because you still have to make it about your personality, what works for you. And what I found that works for me is kind of a combination of a lot of different ones. You know, I use a little bit of behavior base. Look at the safety um, system, information systems. Um, looking at those little little different ones and using them and, and growing people through there. So not really one way or another, like you said, not down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's jump around a little bit. We're going to skip over the next kind of sequence of work that you do. Not that I'm saying that it's not important, but you, yep. do, an, you do another kind of senior high level job coming up next after the construction job. So once you go into this next thing that you decide, hey, I'm going out on my own. Why all of a sudden going from a corporation to saying, hey, I'm going to take a risk on myself? Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's another good question. And a lot of people ask me that question, Jay. <laughs> um, and, and the reason why, I think you kind of look at it from changing from law enforcement to safety a little bit. Uh, I really um, have always wanted to start my own business in, in several aspects. You know, and I just have always had that urge. But I've always had reasons why not to. Um, you know, maybe it's insurance, maybe it's this, or maybe it's not. And so I just got to a point in my career, I said, well, this is now, you know, I, I need to do it and I need to push forward on trying to start my own uh, company and being able to do the things that I thought in my head um, always would work well. So now I get to put the rubber to the road. If you will. So now that you're putting the rubber to the roads, but you do this during a very, very interesting time, if I may add, we're talking yes. a month pre-pandemic. 
give or take from what I could find. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, you're, you don't, you're not a fortune teller, so you're not going to be able to know that this is what's going into to the effect. But all of a sudden, this occurs. What's going through your mind when you decided to take the risk on yourself? And this is all going on because the world has changed. Well, you know, that, that's another good question <laughs> on, on, on that, because a lot of people ask me that, too. And, you know, I, I look at there was just the opportunity right now for me to do it. And I, I do feel that there's a lot of um, opportunity now with the new um, the new administration coming in. Um, there's going to be different things. I think there's a lot of contractors uh, and companies that are going to need a lot of help. And so in looking over the market in this local area, I really felt that there's an opportunity there uh, to, to start the business and, and be able to perform um, great services for uh, organizations. So pre-pandemic, what's the plan with the business? Is it just to take the dive in? Because keep in mind, we're still talking old administration at the time. We're yeah. not talking anything about COVID. So what's mm-hmm. the plan for your business as you're starting it up at the time? So what do you, what? because you have to have a niche. I mean, anytime you go into this yeah. thing, you have a niche. So what's the niche at the time? Because we're talking now future tense or what's going on currently at the time in February before you launch, what were you thinking about going after? Well, there's two things that we really, I really wanted to accomplish. Number one was go after our niche market, which was the small to medium sized construction companies. Uh, we really feel that that 20 to 200 um, employee uh, is really where our niche is, being able to help those companies. Because I think in construction is very unique. The EMR is so important uh, to those companies. And a right. lot of these smaller companies don't understand that concept or understand that until, until a little bit later. And then they can't figure out why they can't compete with the other contractors. Well, they, they realize how important it is after they've got turned down for a contract is normally right. how it goes. Yeah. And several of them, and now, now their rates are going higher and they just can't compete. You know, and now, as you know, Jay, you got to wait three or four years to get that thing down and stuff like that. So I really want to go. I feel that there's a need of, for these contractors in that niche market to understand that EMR, how that is, is a business sense. Right. Um, because that's what it's about is being able to keep their costs down. And EMR is just one of the many things that, as you know, that we can offer for, for companies to make sure that they're, um, addressing those issues because in construction, it, it's the difference between getting a job and not getting a job. Absolutely. And you might be writing the pine for quite some time, depending on that number. Right. So at this particular point, as you're going through this, at what point does all of a sudden you turn around and go, I have an idea. Ted Speaks Live podcast. I'm going to ask you about the title here in a moment, but at what point do you decide this is where I need to go next? Well, I, I've i always, I, I've been very fortunate in my career. I've been able to mentor a lot of safety professionals, and I, I really enjoy doing that, being able to talk to them, be able to help them understand the book, but more importantly, how to deal with people. And I've always enjoyed that. And one thing that I think that I wanted to do was, I know there's a lot of uh, safety professionals that are out there that, don't get the support that I've been fortunate in my career uh, to get, you know, and that sometimes they'll look at, Hey, why don't you get this done quicker? Or, you know, you got to do it this way. If you don't do it this way, we don't need you anymore. And so I wanted to be able to take experiences from professionals all over the country, all over the world um, and see how we can help. So just by listening to a podcast um, and for a 20 minute podcast, Understand, oh, this is how he dealt with this issue. This is how they dealt with this issue or she dealt with this issue. Um, just something that, that that people can listen to and get a little bit of knowledge. And maybe if they get into this situation, they know how to take care of it. This is The Jay Allen Show. Hey, have you ever wanted to hear what's going on around in the world of safety and you're not able to do so? Have you ever wanted to take a listen to what exactly is going around in the world of safety? What if we called that thing Around the Safety Pod? And we told you month over month what is happening in the mix. Would you care to know what would it be worth to you? Now, here's the fun part. Besides that you can find out exactly what's going on inside of the world of safety, there's also other information available there. Stuff that you can start using as early as today. How about you give us a look? Go to our website, safetyfmplus.com. That's safetyfmplus.com to find out what exactly is going on inside of the world of safety, around the world of safety, and inside of the world of safety. And don't forget to tell them that Jay Allen sent you. I'll see you on the other side. 
Make sure to join the revolution. And we are back on the Jay Allen Show on Safety FM. So in what t- what time terrain are we talking about? So roughly when did you come up with the idea and then say, okay, we're going to launch here? Well, for, for the podcast, it was after we started the business. I just felt um, that I wanted to do something more um, for for safety professionals, really focusing on, on more on safety professionals because I really had that 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 drive uh, to make our industry or our our profession better than it is. And, so and when I, do you come across the 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 mayor of podcast town? I I have seen that moniker on LinkedIn. I loved it when I found him, but when did you come across him? Well, Elsie, um, who is the mayor, <laughs> uh, he, he's the one that set us all up. Honestly. Okay. And um, he's out of Milwaukee. We're actually out of Appleton. And so we, mm. my wife and I drive up there once a month and we uh, record them uh, with it. And Elsie does all the work. So I have no idea how he does things. <laughs> so how does the title come about? Because it's a play on several different things. Ted, mm. of course, you, but also you can confuse it with Ted Talk. And then there's right. the speaks portion and then there's the live. But it's a podcast and a podcast is not live unless you're streaming. And if you're streaming, then you're doing radio. So why? How did you come up with the title? Well, uh, my wife came up with that title. Mm-hmm. Okay. With she, uh, she, she liked that Ted, you know, the Ted speaks. She likes that um, because I speak a lot. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, we, that's funny. We had, we had the live on there because we're also do something on, on Clubhouse. Right. With that. And so we also wanted to eventually grow it into an area where people can call in for an hour or something like that. And we could just talk about different safety issues. Perhaps that, you know, like you're having Jay at, at your company or Bob's having at his company or Sarah's having at her company, you know, and, and maybe there's enough people on there. You know what? I've dealt with that before. This is all you need to do, you know, and so we're trying to create that type of a network. So for the people that are not familiar with Clubhouse, and of course, it is a social media platform that's yes. available on Apple. Can you give them a little bit of explanation on exactly how that how it actually works? Sure. Um, Clubhouse is a uh, app that. You can pretty much go on to and listen to any any type of subject that you want. One thing I noticed on there real quickly was there's nobody doing safety, you know, on there. So I looked at that as an opportunity for us to perhaps um, be able to talk to other safety professionals. And so the unfortunate part is right now, and I think they're switching that over, but is that you have to have an iPhone for it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have an iPhone, you can't. But I think they're going. I think that's going to be changing here in the next month or so. And so people will call in, and all it is is a, um, a voice over talking back and forth. You know, so um, if, if somebody's on there, I'll be on the stage, for an example. I can bring somebody on to talk, and then we can have open conversations. And that's what I really like about that is it's a live uh, feature. It's on right right now, and um, kind of goes from there. So just a couple of questions just to kind of clarify to some yeah. of the people that might be out there. So would you almost consider it like old CB radios in regards of that kind of aspect or even like a, an AOL chat room per se? Right. Yeah. I think either with way, a voice though, with a voice, yeah. though, of course. So it's just voice and you have a picture that goes up there and, and you talk and you can leave the room whenever you want. You know, it's kind of nice that way. Um, it's just an opportunity to, uh, if you're having a frustrating day, if you want to share some great ideas, um, it, it's just a great a great uh, platform to have multi, multiple people in there and really kind of networking since we can't really do that as much right now with the COVID going on. So now do you have a set time that your show airs on Clubhouse? So do you have like a particular day or do you just do it kind of based off of announcement? Because I've seen some of the Clubhouse aspects where people are on 5.30 in the morning until 8.30 in the morning where it's just kind of a continuing conversation. So how is yours currently set up? Well, currently we are set up for Mondays at two o'clock Central Standard Time, and um, we've been doing that now for probably about uh, two months. And so we're we're gonna that's our time slot that we have. Uh, it's not necessarily the best one. Mondays at two o'clock aren't, aren't always the best, but we're finding that people are are really enjoying the show. And um, you know what we do is we talk about current OSHA issues or any issues that somebody may have. You know. Um, and then looking at any uh, recent citations. So we try to keep the conversation flowing on different on different things. So now, do you ever take any of the clubhouse stuff and make it become a show? I know that you said that you normally go up to the mayor once a month, but do you ever take any of that content and convert it over? Well, you know, yesterday was the first first time that we did something. We have um, we released a new podcast today, 
And on that, uh, I had uh, Pat Carroll, who is our uh, guest on there. Great he guy. actually came on. Yeah, he is. Very tremendous story. Oh, and, yeah, look, lo- love the Delta story. He said Delta when he was on the show, so I, I feel that I can get away with saying it now. Yeah, and he, I, he said that on ours too. So, but yeah, he's a great guy. Um, a, a tremendous amount of knowledge. But he came on to our clubhouse yesterday, you know, and, and did some talking and, and talked about what we're going to talk about today on, on the show. So um, we're looking at more of bringing the people that are on the podcast the day before and kind of just talking about it and seeing if people have questions or, or anything. Very cool. Very cool. So, and then on your podcast as well, you do something over the weekend. So you did say that you, re- that you released an episode today on Tuesday. You had something going on with, with Pat previously, but then on over the weekend, you kind of do a, we'll call it a re-release or a rebroadcast or a re-reference to a previous podcast. And it, it for people to go back could kind of go to make sure that your catalog is active. So you're, you're doing that. And you're putting focus on certain items on there. How are how is that working out for you? Are you are you getting a lot of feedback on some of the older catalog? And we say older, of course, we're talking a little over. You know, you're yeah. talking about less than a year, but right. older catalog. But how are how are you seeing that working out for you? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, great question. It, it has worked out really well for us. Um, we call it the uh, Saturday Rewind. Mm-hmm. And so we just kind which of which some people that. might not know what rewind even means. So that's true. <laughs> <laughs> us more experienced people do though right? <laughs> I, I don't know if it's experience i just have been around in this stuff for way too long probably that's just the way i like to say it, <laughs> well you know? yeah i mean it, the way that i look at it is when i start looking at some of the professional broadcasters that i looked at and they're either passing away or retiring i go yeah i, I think i have to start realizing that i am becoming old at this particular point <laughs> in my life so as you're seeing this and you're going forward with everything, um, what are you enjoying the most? Are you enjoying the consulting? Are you enjoying the podcasting? And I mean, you got quite a bit going on. Are you enjoying the clubhouse? What do you enjoy the most out of all three aspects? You know, Jay, uh, that's a great question. And It's like, which is your favorite hard. child? Which is your favorite right. child? I just asked you that out loud. <laughs> I, I, t- I, tell her, yeah, I tell everybody, I only work half days, 12 hours days, no. you know, and they seem like two hour days to me. Mm-hmm. I, I just... I'm so fortunate and been so blessed um, to be able to have the passion, um, a little bit of knowledge. And uh, uh, I, I just love everything about it. I love being able to develop safety professionals. I love being able to go out in the companies, have companies look at safety. Safety is very important, but also there's a huge financial gain that a lot of companies, I think, miss if they don't do it. To me, safety is about a profit center. It can be mm-hmm. a profit center if you do it correctly. And so it can make a difference. So I'm passionate about making sure businesses understand that. And then lastly, with the clubhouse, the clubhouse is exciting because I get to touch base with a lot of people I probably haven't seen in a while um, and get to learn more people and, and, and look at safety, you know, what's going on in the safety world in different industries. And and so that's what's kind of exciting about all three of them. So to answer your question without answering your question, I guess, would be <laughs> all of them. <laughs> so you did bring up something that I find very important. You did refer to safety as a profit center. And yes. let's be realistic. Most of the times when you interact with most companies, they, in general, not you in particular, um, they do refer to it as a cost center. So right. how do you make the transition when you're speaking to the people in management inside of an organization for them to understand that it's a profit center and not so much a cost center? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and one thing I think um, is important, when, when I started with the construction company that, that I uh, was telling you about, we we were paying out in workers' comp $1.2 million a year just in worker comp, doing about $85 million worth of business. That's not very good. Uh, by the time we left, we were doing about $285 million and paying $225,000 out. That right there is just kind of to show you what a company can do if you do it and implement it right. It takes a while. It takes a process. But what happens is that you're also creating culture. Once you start creating that culture, people are starting to work together. They understand what you're trying to do. At the end of the day, we're all, all three of the wheels are working together, quality, production, and safety. And they all have to work together to have that success. So I, I'm, I've, I've seen it happen. I've worked at another company, the exact same thing. So I'm very passionate about making sure, number one, people are safe, but number two, that we can have a return on dollar. And, and so I always say, you know, a four to one, is, which is a lot of people say four to one, but I think it's actually even higher than that when you throw a lot of the indirect cost in there. 
So, of course, when you bring up numbers and you talk about your past experience and you're talking to organizations, normally that very odd question comes out that goes like this. What is the time frame that we're going to see results like that? So how do you handle that? Yeah, you know, and that's, that's a good question because that, that, that's something people want to know right away, right? Um, I think when, when you look at that, um, it all depends on every situation. All that kind of stuff is different. But once you start a plan, you form a plan, and you start creating that culture, you can, you can really turn things around, I believe, within that three years process to get that going. Um, because it takes a while, right? I mean, people aren't going to want to change automatically. Cultures just don't change. I mean, we all know that. And so I always try to be honest with them and, and look at say, hey, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a process, but you're going to see changes. You're going to see changes as we go along. And it's going to be a really neat ride. And, and it's not necessarily just going to be on safety because your production also improves because you have happier workers. You have workers that understand what they're doing versus asking questions. And at the end of the day, you're going to be able to improve the bottom line of the company while keeping employees safe. So when when you get contacted and you go into an organization, are they asking you to change the culture or are they asking you to change the safety culture? Well, in a lot of the clients that, that we have right now, they're, they're more or less looking at, hey, what do we need to do to make sure we can get by? Okay. You know, I, I, from the OSHA standpoint. And so that's what we go in and do is try to help them understand the importance of what we just talked about, you know, making sure that we have the production quality and safety working together, but also that it's not just about the OSHA standards. Because, Jay, as you know, know just as well as I do, you can have every OSHA standard um, completely done correctly and still like getting people hurt. Yep. You know, that 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 is a reality. And so we have to look beyond that. We have to think about what's best for the company and how we're going to ensure that you're uh, employees are going home safe each and every day while improving your bottom line. So as you're seeing all of this and you're getting to interact with these companies and you're, you're kind of get, giving a rough guesstimate of what the timeline might be and you're seeing what's working, what do you see with everything that's been going on over the last year and changes inside of the industry on how we're looking at work? What do you think some of the changes you might see coming? I know I'm asking the crystal ball question, but what do you think that you, you will be need to be focusing on here, let's say over the next six months? Well, I think that right now, you know, if you're just looking at um, enforcement from OSHA, you know, that stimulus package, $100 million went to OSHA, and they they have a plan, right? They have a plan that they're going to come in and, and enforce, enforce. They're going to be looking at a lot of different issues. And I think that companies have to be prepared uh, for that because um, they're hiring more people. It's going to take a year or so for them to get a lot of those people in place, but they're, they're going to be going through a lot more enforcement. So you have to be ready for that. And as an organization, do you have that paperwork done? And a lot of the organizations that we've worked with in the past and that I've worked with in, at other places don't understand the importance of written. You know, you can do something, but if it's not written down, if it's not taken care of properly, it doesn't mean anything. So I, I think right now the main focus is probably within that. And then number two, obviously, always taking care of the employees. You know, uh, it's hard to keep employees nowadays. Employees are leaving some of these jobs very quickly. So if we can keep them safe, knowing that they're safe, knowing their family knows that they're going to work and they're going to return to work, that's huge for a, a, a company to be able to have a return on investment in that. Well, and, and you did bring up something very important there because back in what I will say the golden years, it was companies offered pensions and they offered other things for you to stay there long term. So if I was a vested employee who had been there 20 to 40 years, there was normally a pension waiting at the end. That's not so much the case nowadays. So how do you look at companies are able to retain talent for them not to be the, the quick turnaround with a lot of the things that you see? Yeah, you know, and that, that's really a great battle, right, Jay? I mean, it, it's hard getting employees right now to uh, come, come to work on a consistent basis. But what I try to tell the employers when I work, when we work with them is I say, you know, if, if they're going to work, they know that they're going to be going home safe. They're going to be making their money. I always told uh, employees that I worked with is, you know, there's two important days every day of the week. Number one, the day that you get to go home every day. And number two, that you get your paycheck on time. Everything else is a bonus, you know. And I, I think that's something that is really important for uh, employees to know because, you know, they have families. Every Everybody has their own issues. Everybody has their own things going on, right? I work to live. I don't live to work. And I think all of our employees are very similar to that. 
So if we can keep them focused on what they're doing, um, it's not an easy task and it's not a crystal ball like you were saying, right? But I think it's something that if, if employees know that their company organization cares for them, they are much more likely to stay there and even get paid less in some circumstances because they know somebody cares about them and they can make a difference. Now, you know how many employers are thinking about that. It's like, we can pay them less. How is that going to work? But that's the truth. You did say something there that I think is a golden nugget. The people tend to think about it of, I, I work to live, not live to work. Did I say that backwards? I might have said that backwards. But think about it in that particular fashion for just a moment. When people think about it, most of the times when you're inside of this particular profession that you and I are in, mm-hmm. it's we, most of us just work, 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 and then live on occasions until you kind of get it. There's a moment in time that it goes, and then it's like, maybe I'm doing this backwards. So at what point do you think that you looked at it and and it clicked for you? Well, I think uh, for me personally, I think it was for when we started having kids, you know, Uh, you look at life a lot differently. I think when we're all young, we all think, ah, there's no way anything's ever going to happen to me. Indestructible. Yeah, exactly, right? (laughs) Mm-hmm. And uh, as as time goes on, you said, look, you know what? It's not about me. It's not about, you know, that it, it's about other things. And it's about, uh, you know, being able to, to support and, and all of those type of issues that come in. And I think for me, I start that I started getting that. And then I started going, you know what? I have employees that are working for us all over the country that have the exact same thing. So I think that's kind of where I started is, is, is the kids will definitely sober you up a little bit. How's that? <laughs> that will definitely do the trick. It's it's always interesting because people talk about that transition of when you have kids on how the world changes. But until you go through the experience, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. It's very true, Jay. I mean, once you have the kids and stuff like that, you appreciate that. And some days you don't. <laughs> well, we'll I don't know if we're supposed to put that on recording, but it already happened. <laughs> well, Ted, if people want to know more about you and what you have going on, where can they find out some more information? Sure. Thank you. Um, you can find us on uh, on our website, which is healthandsafetynow.com. You can go there and find out the information or on LinkedIn with Ted Carew um, on LinkedIn. Well, Ted, I do appreciate you coming on to the show today. Hey, I, I appreciate you uh, having me on the show. This was really fun and exciting to be able to talk to you. I think you're doing, you're doing tremendously great things here, Jay, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Safety FM. Changing safety cultures, one broadcast and one podcast at a time. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.